You are listening to the Justice in Heels podcast with me, your host, Danielle Hayward. Join me as I discuss interesting legal topics with inspiring female legal professionals who paved the way for the rest of us. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Justice in Heels podcast. Today I'm joined by Robin Shepard, who's going to speak to us today about the new Domestic Violence Act. Robin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So firstly, before we start, can you maybe just tell us a bit more about yourself? Of course. So my name is Robin Shepard. I am an attorney. I am also a very proud dog mom. (laughs) I love spending time at the beach. I am from Cape Town, born and bred in Cape Town. And on my spare time, I enjoy just the downtime, going to markets, watching Harry Potter, you know, doing all of the the fun millennial things. But I also have a really big passion for people and for the law. And my favorite thing is to really just utilize the law to help people. That's a really big passion of mine. That's really me in a nutshell. Thank you for that. Okay, so. (laughs) The amended Domestic Violence Act added some behaviours to the definition of domestic violence. Can you maybe just tell us what behaviours are now part of the domestic violence or the the definition of domestic violence? And then, like, what was already included? So domestic violence, as it stands, we've now... It, it has been expanded, okay? So there are significant changes and the changes include spiritual abuse. So for example, in South Africa, we are a, a melting pot of cultures and beliefs and races. And that means that everybody is entitled to believe in whatever it is that they want to. And the act now protects those individuals who might have a different belief as you do. And it protects them from being able to embrace that constitutional right that they have, where if they want to believe in something, they have that right to do that. The act fully protects them. The act also now is extended to protecting the elderly, which is great. The elderly are a vulnerable member of society and it makes sure that the elderly are not covered and it's now in line with the the Older Persons Act. The Domestic Violence Act also now makes sure that you cannot expose a child to domestic violence. So anything that you do that exposes children who are also vulnerable members of society constitutes as a act of domestic violence which is really important because we need to ensure that the best interests of children are of paramount importance in our society and the act also refers to controlling behavior and coercive behavior so the act now extends to protecting individuals who are controlled in such a way of you cannot do abc which causes harm. And then in terms of coercion, also forcing individuals to to refrain from doing something or to doing something. Naturally, that causes harm. So those are the really big significant changes that the Act has now brought into play, which is great. But what the Act did previously, domestic violence, it covered physical abuse, emotional abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, all the, the, I wouldn't say the normal types of abuse, but the more common types of abuse that we do here in society. Whereas now it's really been extended to, to just cover a bit more, which is really, really great. And it's such a big step in, in protecting children and the vulnerable as well. So it's a really big step for us. Fantastic. Um, So we're going to touch on the topic of protection orders and how protection orders or the the application of protection orders has changed. Um, But can you maybe just quickly tell our listeners what is a protection order? 
So protection order is used when you are going through, of course, a very, not a very nice situation at home or wherever it is. A protection order you apply to court and it's used to protect you from a specific harm. And there would be circumstances in a protection order. Each protection order is naturally very different. The circumstances are very different. But the protection order protects you from someone either entering into your home or being within a specific meter, kilometers from you. It protects you from anybody communicating with you. So you use a protection order to ensure that you are safe and that harm doesn't occur to you. So that's when we use protection orders. Fantastic. I think that's like a very uh, like basic explanation of what a protection order is. So thank you so much for that. Um, now I want to ask you, so I saw that the act mentions that you can now get a protection order through email. Have you maybe had clients who apply for protection orders via email? How Good, do you think this amendment is, practically speaking, will the courts actually be able to, you know, follow through with it? I haven't had a client as yet who has made use of that specific step. I do, however, think the intent is there and it's a great intention and it sounds, the initiative sounds amazing. However, if we think of it realistically with our courts administration, I, I do foresee issues. I think anybody who is in practice or who works with courts on a day-to-day -day, regular basis sees that with any um, administrative you know, company, there, there's always some struggles. And I, I do foresee that that would be the same with getting protection orders over email. Again, I haven't had it as yet. I look forward to seeing that so I could see it in practice. But I do foresee it being not the easiest, but the intent is there. The, there is good intention. So I see the intent behind it. Maybe in 10 years time, we don't know, maybe our courts will get more efficient and then this will actually be like the way to go for people wanting to get a protection order in the future. Yes, I think once we move on to a fully online system, I know in Cape Town we're still very much old school like that. So I think if we, if all the courts and that's district court and high court all move on to an online system, which will take naturally a good couple of years, then I think it's going to be a great process and I think it would move a lot more smoother. But because we're still stuck in between the old and the new system, I do foresee there being gaps in the system in terms of implementing it. But like I said, the intention is definitely there. Definitely. Okay, so are there any notable changes or updates in the in terms of the enforcement mechanisms for protection orders? So now with the new act, a warrant of arrest is issued simultaneously when a interim protection order is granted, which is something that didn't happen before. And that is great as well, because it means that should someone breach the terms and conditions of the interim protection order, there's a, a warrant of arrest waiting, waiting for, <laughs> for that person. So that's also great. The Act also allows individuals to approach the court outside of ordinary court hours if it is necessary to protect them from harm. And that is also a really big step, again, to protecting the vulnerable members of society. And I think those two steps in itself create a more, a greater sense of security for individuals approaching the court with the protection order and making use of the Domestic Violence Act, which now sets out these specific mechanisms. Amazing. So um, are there any other notable changes that you've seen in the Domestic Violence Act that you maybe want to tell our listeners about? So there's also the 
The Domestic Violence Act also now allows the South African Police Services to use whatever necessary force, while well, reasonable force, to to overcome any any force or any resistance when they do visits to specific residents. Um, and that's also really important, of course. There, there's a balance that one needs to take into consideration when using force, but the act allows for that now. Again, it must be reasonable. So that's on a case by case basis on what what the circumstances are. And I think again that that again it shows that there is a level of protection for those who are in harm's way. That the act again it allows for an individual in society to really make use of the protective mechanisms that the police can give them and the courts can give them as well. Fantastic. So I know that there's this misconception and I've heard a lot of people, especially in Cape Town, um, actually tell me about this misconception. And that is that if you get a protection order, you cannot also open let's say, for example, an assault case at the police station. Can you maybe just tell our listeners why that is not the case? So because you have a protection order, it doesn't... Okay, let, let's start again. The protection order and an assault case, they would fall under two different courts in any case. So an, an assault would fall under the criminal court, whereas the domestic violence would fall under that specialized court as well. And nothing precludes you from getting the protection order, firstly, to protect yourself and to make sure that that does not happen again, but then to ensure that you have sought the proper recourse through different court mechanisms, for example, going to saps laying a, a case of assault on the, the individual and that following it, its course in the normal course outside of the domestic violence um the protect the protection the domestic violence courts yes that's one <laughs> so um the 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 misconception really stems from people assuming that because you have a protection order that covers everything and you're not allowed to to use your rights in terms of any other courts which is very wrong and it is um, a very narrow a narrow approach to to our law and it limits individuals from really utilizing their rights remember you have the right to approach a court you have the right to safety and security you have all these rights in the constitution and to be able to enforce that you need to be able to go to specific courts just because you have a protection order it does not mean that the buck stops there if you have been assaulted you're entitled to go to a different court to deal with that in itself thank you for that yeah i think the misconception I don't know if this actually comes from the individuals or if it comes from maybe police officers that's not like up to date with everything or a lot of stories that we hear, maybe they are just lazy and they don't really mm -hmm. want to help victims of domestic violence. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's definitely something that needs to be addressed. So in saying that, um, do you have any other misconceptions that you maybe think South Africans may have in terms of protection orders? I think the 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 biggest one is the the misuse of protection orders. I I know I've been in a, a case where an individual used the protection order as a as a mechanism to try to evict someone from their home mm -hmm. and that in itself the court the court had issued the protection order well the interim in the beginning and that individual had just followed the procedure so there is a bit of a misuse of, of protection orders as well um 
And again, it comes down to the misinformation, as you've mentioned, of protection orders and when you can use them, when you can't use them. But also the taking advantage of what the, pur the, the purpose of a protection order is for. It's for to protect you from harm. And what I've seen personally is that person A and B might not like each other and then they go and take protection orders out against each other. And whilst I do understand, I can I can empathize to a level of, okay, you obviously don't like each other as individuals, understanding the impact that those orders have on your life as a whole definitely gets misused. And it's, again, it comes down to the misinformation and perhaps maybe the courts not informing the public when they do come to apply for, for protection orders, looking into the merits of what actually is the problem here, instead of it just being neighbor A and B not liking each other. You know, there, there's a greater purpose for protection orders. Yeah. And there's other legal remedies that you can follow if you just you know, don't want to, or not even legal remedies, just normal remedies that you, you exactly. have Um, if you don't want to interact with someone. Exactly. So that's the interesting one. Um, So, I mean, like how fast or when should you get a protection order? Let me rather ask that. So let's say, for example, um, you've now experienced this, uh, like abusive behaviors from the person that you're living with or your spouse or your partner or whoever how quick should you get a protection order and is there a time like a time period after which you cannot apply for a protection order still how does that work so there's no time limit in terms of when you can't get a protection order but again, in terms of when you should get one, that is a case-by-case -case basis and different circumstances. I think you should apply to court immediately for a protection order if you feel that you are in harm's way, whether that be physically, emotionally. If you fall within the ambit of what a protection order can cover and you feel that that is required, I advise you to immediately make use of that. But again, it comes down to that specific person. So it's a bit difficult to say when should you do it. I think when you feel that you, you need it and you know that this will provide safety that you need, then you need to definitely approach the court for that. So what advice do you have for domestic violence victims out there who may want to get legal protection under the new Domestic Violence Act? So my advice to, to individuals is firstly, look for emotional support, find, find a friend, find a family member, go look for a local organization if you can to to be there to help you through it it is a it can be a long process it's a very emotional process of course it is it's a very sensitive topic that we're dealing with that would be my first piece of advice is to find someone to be there for you on this journey because it's not going to take one or two weeks it, it's a journey that you're going to be on that's my number one piece of advice so that you have someone there who's in your corner and can back you up as 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 your journey goes but then my second piece of advice would be to if you're in that situation record everything record what it is that you're going through have dates have times see if you have witnesses make a timeline set out for you just so that when the time comes and you need to re recall everything you have that with you and that'll just make the the pro the storytelling process a bit easier for you and then my third piece of advice would be to of course approach a legal advisor who specializes in domestic violence cases it is a very sensitive topic. It's one that requires attorneys who 
are passionate about this and who want to help you as the individual. Um, I think that's really important. And the attorney or the legal advisor, whoever it is that you seek that legal counsel for, they will be able to explain your rights to you. They'll be able to guide you through the legal process of what will happen, what, what won't happen. And you'll feel less exposed and less taken advantage of if you have a proper support structure around you to get you through that so the, that would be my my three pieces of advice for anyone in that situation excellent advice thank you so much and robin thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast and thank you for advising our listeners on this very important topic and this topic that i feel not a lot of people are really addressing in south africa Thank you so much for having me. So where can our listeners reach you? Your listeners can find me on LinkedIn. I have a LinkedIn profile, but it's Robin Shepherd. And they can also find me at www.skumanlaw.co.za. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Justice in Hills podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with your friends on social media and tag us. As this podcast has a legal element, just a quick disclaimer that all views expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of the firms, companies or brands that we are associated with. Until next time, goodbye.